The Book of Confidence by Father Thomas de Saint Laurent. Chapter 2 Nature and Characteristics of Confidence. Confidence is a firm hope. Saint Thomas Aquinas, with that conciseness which characterizes his genius, defines confidence as a hope fortified by solid conviction. We shall devote this chapter to the explanation of these profound words. Let us consider attentively the terms employed by the angelic doctor. Confidence, he writes, is a hope. Not that ordinary hope common to all the faithful, from which he clearly distinguishes it by a precise term. It is a fortified hope. However, Note well here there is no difference in nature, only in degree. The faint glimmer of the dawn is as much a part of the same day as the dazzling light of the midday sun. Hence hope and confidence are equally parts of the same virtue. One is the complete blossoming of the other. Ordinary hope cannot exist in a soul that yields to despair. A certain amount of anxiety, however, is not incompatible with its existence. But when ordinary hope reaches that perfection which merits for it the name of confidence, then it becomes more sensitive and fragile. It can no longer bear the slightest degree of hesitation imaginable. The slightest doubt would lessen it and so reduce it to the level of mere hope. The royal prophet David is very exact in his choice of expressions when he calls confidence a super hope. It is indeed a question of virtue carried to the very highest degree imaginable. And Father Saint Jour, one of the most esteemed spiritual writers of the 17th century, justly affirms it as an extraordinary and heroic hope. Confidence is not then a common flower. It grows on the crests. It does not permit itself to be picked except by magnanimous souls. Confidence is fortified by faith. Let us take this study further. What sovereign strength fortifies hope to the point of rendering it unshakable in the face of the assault of adversity? Faith. The confident soul remains mindful of the promises of our Heavenly Father and has meditated upon them profoundly. She knows that God cannot fail to keep His word, hence her unalterable confidence. Danger may threaten her, surround her, even strike her, but she remains calm and serene. In spite of the imminent danger, she repeats the words of the psalmist, The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the protector of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? There is the closest affinity between faith and confidence. The two are most intimately related. A contemporary theologian tells us that confidence has its source and root in faith. Hence, the more profound our faith, the stronger and more deeply rooted will be our confidence. In the sacred scriptures, we find the same word faith, fides, used in turn to designate these virtues. Confidence is unshakable. The preceding considerations may appear to be excessively abstract. It was necessary for us, however, to establish our foundation upon these considerations. From them, we shall deduce the characteristics of true confidence. Confidence, writes Father St. Jour, is firm, stable, and constant, to such an eminent degree that it cannot be shaken I no longer say just overthrown, 
by anything in the world. Neither the most afflicting temporal misfortunes nor the greatest spiritual difficulties will disturb the peace of soul that trusts in God. Such a soul, even when unforeseen calamities have laid all her earthly happiness in ruins around her, when every earthly hope is blighted, will remain unmoved. She will simply turn to our Divine Lord She will lean upon him with a confidence all the more assured in proportion to the degree she feels herself deprived of all earthly assistance. She will pray with greater fervor, and in the darkness of the time of trial, she will wait in silence for God's appointed hour of relief. Such confidence, no doubt, is rare. But unless it attains to this minimum of perfection, it does not merit the name of confidence. We find some sublime examples of this degree of confidence recorded in Holy Scripture and in the lives of the saints. Such was the confidence of Job. When stricken with every possible misfortune, the death of his children, the loss of all his wealth, reduced to direst poverty, afflicted with a dreadful disease, He never murmured. The Lord gave, he said, and the Lord hath taken away. As it hath pleased the Lord, so is it done. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Although he should kill me, I will trust in him. Sublime confidence, which God rewarded magnificently. The hour of Job's trials came to an end. He recovered his health, acquired wealth far exceeding what he had lost, and enjoyed more prosperity than ever before. In the life of St. Martin, it is related that once when traveling, the saint fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him of everything and were about to put him to death, when suddenly, moved to repentance, or struck by some mysterious fear, just as all hope seemed lost, they set him free. Afterwards, someone asked the illustrious bishop if in the presence of such imminent danger he had not felt afraid. Not in the least, he answered. I knew that God's help is never nearer than when all human aid is furthest from us. Unfortunately, most Christians fail to imitate such examples. Never are they so slow to turn to God as in the hour of trial. Many neglect to send forth that appealing cry to God for which he waits in order to come to their assistance. What a fatal negligence! Providence, Louis of Granada used to say, wishes to give the solution to the extraordinary difficulties of life directly, while it leaves to secondary causes the resolving of ordinary difficulties. But it is always necessary to cry out for divine help. That help God gives us with pleasure. Far from bothering the nurse who suckles him, the baby brings her relief. Others in their troubles pray fervently, but they do not persevere in prayer. If they are not heard at once, they fall into a state of unreasonable discouragement. They do not understand the ways of divine grace. God treats us as children. Sometimes he seems deaf to our prayers because he likes to hear us calling upon him. Why be discouraged so quickly? when on the contrary, we should pray more insistently than ever. This is the doctrine taught by St. Francis de Sales. Quote, Providence only delays in coming to our aid in order to excite us to confidence. If our Heavenly Father does not always grant us what we ask, it is to keep us near Him and to make us press Him by our loving violence to give us what we want. He showed this plainly to the two disciples at Emmaus, 
with whom he did not consent to remain until the close of the day and after they had pressed him. End quote. Confidence relies on God alone. Steadfast firmness is then the first characteristic of confidence. The second quality of this virtue is even more perfect. The souls that possess this perfect confidence in God think very little of the help of creatures, whether resulting from their own individual efforts, from their own intelligence, their judgments, their knowledge, their skill, their wealth, from their friends, their relations, or from anything that they possess, whether it be assistance they might expect from others, because they know the weakness of all created human help. They regard such help as what it is in reality, and what St. Teresa called it, dry branches that break under the first pressure. We must not suppose for a moment that this wholehearted confidence in God means that when we are in difficulties, we are to make no efforts of our own to overcome them. That we are to fold our arms, do nothing, and hope for God to come to our assistance. Such a theory would lead to fatalism, or at the very least, to perilous passivity. No, God does not wish us to sleep. He demands that we imitate him. His perfect activity has no limits. He is pure act. He requires us to work. We must act then, but we must leave it to him to render our actions efficacious. Help thyself and heaven will help thee. Such is the economic plan of God's providence. Let us work then as well as we are able, but always with our mind and heart fixed on God. Without God's help, we are utterly powerless. Unless the Lord build the house, thy labor in vain that build it. Without me, says our Lord himself, you can do nothing. In the supernatural order, this impotence is absolute. Heed well the teachings of the theologians. Without divine grace, we cannot keep the whole of the commandments for any length of time. Without grace, we cannot resist all the temptations, at times so violent, which assail us. Without grace, we cannot have a good thought, say the shortest prayer. Without it, we cannot even invoke the holy name of Jesus. All that we can accomplish in the supernatural order comes to us wholly and entirely from God. Even in the natural order, it is God who gives us success. St. Peter had worked the whole night. He had endured his labors. He had a profound knowledge of the secrets of his difficult occupation. And yet he had caught nothing. But as soon as our Lord enters the little boat and Peter, at the word of the Divine Master, once more casts his nets, he attains an undeniably miraculous catch, so great that the nets are broken. In all that you have to do, said St. Ignatius of Loyola, here is the rule of rules to follow. Trust in God, whilst acting as if success in everything depended wholly on yourself, and at the same time, whilst you leave nothing undone to ensure success, do not rely on your own efforts, knowing that God alone can do everything and you nothing. Confidence rejoices when deprived of all earthly aid. Not to grow discouraged when the mirage of earthly hope vanishes, to rely on God's assistance alone is indeed exalted virtue. However, the vigorous wings of true confidence rise to even more sublime regions. It reaches them by a type of refinement of heroism. 
Then it attains the very highest degree of perfection. This degree consists in rejoicing when we find ourselves deprived of all human help, abandoned by relatives, by friends, by all creatures who will not or cannot help us in any way whatsoever. How profound the wisdom of those souls who can thus rejoice in such painful circumstances. To sing the canticle of joy when struck by such blows as would naturally destroy our courage, we must have an intimate knowledge of the sacred heart of Jesus. We must believe with an absolute belief that nothing can change his compassion, his mercy, and his omnipotent goodness. We must have a positive certainty that the hour of our most desperate troubles is the time he has appointed to come to our assistance. After his conversion, St. Francis of Assisi despised all the dreams of glory which for a long time had dazzled him. He shunned all worldly gatherings and retired into the woods where he spent long hours in prayer and meditation. He gave generous alms. The young saint's father was displeased at this change. He brought him before the diocesan court and charged him with squandering his property. There, in the presence of the astonished bishop, Francis renounced his paternal inheritance. He gave up everything for which he was indebted to his family, even his clothes. He stripped himself of all. Then, filled with supernatural happiness, he cried out, Now, yes, O oh my God, I can call thee more truly than ever, our Father who art in heaven. Behold how the saints act. You souls overwhelmed with misfortunes, destitute of all human aid, do not murmur. God does not ask that you should feel a sensible joy which is impossible to our weakness. Only do not let your faith weaken. Summon up your courage, and according to the expression dear to St. Francis de Sales, in the innermost point of your soul, try to have joy. God has given you the sign by which you may know that the appointed hour in which he will come to your aid is near. He has deprived you of all earthly assistance. Now is the time to resist the anxiety of human nature. You have reached that part of the interior office when you should sing the Magnificat and offer incense. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. The Lord is nigh. Follow this counsel. You will feel the benefit of it. If the Divine Master did not let himself be moved by such confidence, he would no longer be the same Lord shown by the Gospel to be so compassionate, the one who trembled with painful emotion at the sight of our suffering. To a saintly religious, Sister Benignus Consolata Ferrero, who died in the odor of sanctity, our Lord once said, If I am good to all, I am particularly good to those who confide in me. Dost thou know which souls profit the most by my goodness? Those who hope the most. Confident souls steal my graces.